So what you had to do was understand that the apparent mass, by definition, is the normal force divided by g. That's why in this, when I went from here, I didn't know its normal mass or normal force. But what I did know is if I divided it by g, that that ratio is 2. Should be. Now, this particular one is for Bernoulli's equation. It's a plug and chugger's dream. Numbers are flying all over the place, but it's something where there is a pothole that I mentioned earlier before that you're going to have to pay attention to. Fluid goes into a pipe. The area of the pipe is 10 square centimeters. It's at a pressure of three atmospheres and a velocity of five meters per second. It drops a height of 40 meters to a new pipe that has an area of 4 square meters. The question is, what's the new velocity and what's the new pressure? There are two equations that you have to know in this particular one and a conversion. The first equation that you knock out is the equation of continuity, or as I like to say it, the conservation of flow that the volume rate at the beginning of the pipe must be the volume rate at the end, that the flow must be constant. So V2 is A1 V1 over A2. A1 is 10 square centimeters. V1 is 5 meters per second. Uh, A2 is 4, and so I'm left with 12.5, I think. Yep. Now, one of the things that people may notice is that the area I kept in square centimeters. The reason why I kept it in square centimeters is because I wanted to save time. Converting them to meters squared is a is just a waste is wouldn't say waste of effort. You're not doing any good for the situation because the conversions will cancel as well. And as long as those two are in the same units, it doesn't really matter what they are. They could be furlongs for all I for all I know the ratio would be the same. And so the velocity is that guy. Now, I have my favorite equations. Bernoulli's is my least favorite equation. Pressure has several contributing factors. Potential and kinetic. And so those are the factors that include this. And so we need to pick, we need to find P2. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of that. And why is that? Because it's not what? It's final is zero, correct. I set the lowest point as the zero height or zero potential. You need a reference point, so I might as well pick that one, uh, which means that the height one is 40. That means that P1 plus rho G H1 plus one-half rho V1 squared minus one-half rho V2 squared is equal to P2. Now, when I factor this out, the rho, oh, and it's water, water in the pipe, so it's 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So I get GH1 plus V1 squared over 2 minus V2 squared over 2 and this must go in. This is the pothole 
that you need to pay attention to. Rho G H and one half Rho V squared naturally kick out Newtons per meter squared. But notice what I did. The pressure at the top was three atmospheres. And I'm asking for the final pressure in atmospheres, which means that you can't add that to that correctly until your units are consistent. So Newtons per meter squared is in the numerator, so we have to put the conversion factor in the denominator. This means we have 3 plus 1,000 G 9.8 H1 40 plus uh, 5 squared over 2 minus 12.5 squared over 2 all divided by 1.013 times 10 to the fifth. get 6.22 atmospheres. And that's the total pressure. So looking at this, it's following Bernoulli's equation in a set array of instructions. And so there you go. That's a Bernoulli's equation problem. Is what? Yeah, the 1,000 is for water, correct. If I didn't give it, a valid question to ask is, what's the fluid in the pipe? Because I need to know its density. So if, if water is just 1,000. And before we move on to, um, wow, we went through those pretty quickly. The one thing that I do want to clarify is the term uh, specific gravity. And that specific gravity is simply a ratio. It equals to the density of the material divided by the density of water. And there are no units because it is a, it is a ratio. And so when they say specific gravity is 1.2, that means the specific or the density of the material is 1.2 times that of uh, water. down to the last 30 minutes. Alright. I know, right? Now, this particular one we're going to do, it's a simple problem. I want to know the length L if it oscillates 20 times in 60 seconds. It is a simple pendulum. It's a mass that's just swinging back and forth. The period is 2 pi times the square root of L over G. I'm looking for L. This equation is not dependent on the mass of the, of the uh, pendulum. It is not dependent upon theta. So solving for L, T squared equals 4 pi squared L over G. So L is g period squared over 4 pi squared. g is 9.8, p 
period is, ooh, we're going to need to know what a period is. Total time divided by the number of oscillations is equal to the period. So this is that. And so the number that I get So that is uh, the length. Now one of the things that I'm going to do is, as I'm kind of showing you stuff, is I'm going to do a problem that I put on a test a while back, and what I do with these numbers is I make them click so that they work out. This is a problem that I had on a test a year ago. Uh, I am not... Uh, I think I'm elevated enough, and so I declare that gravity is equal to 10. I know that you guys use 9.8, but in my class, 10 just makes the numbers work out so much better. But it's the physics that I want you guys to understand. You have a mass on a spring, and that spring stretches a distance x, and Oddly enough, that total distance is 10 divided by the square of pi. Why? Let's find out. When you see a number like this, you know that maybe some pi's should cancel with each other. I say that the number of times that it oscillates after it stretches out, you pull it again and then it oscillates, that how long would it take to oscillate 30 times. So we need to have the period of a spring pendulum 2 pi square root m over k. We need to understand that the total time is uh, total time divided by the number is the period. And then there's something a little bit more in this. In the stretched position, it stretched a distance x. And one of the things that annoys my students greatly is the fact that I try to throw a beat down on all the plug and chuggers that are taking my class. And so what I do is I arrange problems where I give a natural advantage to the people who understand physics and do it with alphabet soup. Because it's hanging a distance x, there's a force of the spring up and a force of gravity down. According to Hooke's law, f spring is kx. It's resting there, so the sum of the forces is equal to zero. The goal of this is to find k. or find M, either one, it doesn't matter. So the forces up is KX, the forces down is MG, so KX is equal to MG, so K, um, M, let's solve for M, because this is the point, KX over G. Yes, this is where the mass is, in the hanging position, yes. Now, it's definitely not going to be zero once you pull it more and let it oscillate. But the goal is you had to play with Hooke's Law to understand the relationship between mass and K. And I was very specific in the test, and I said, you have no idea what the mass is. 
I intentionally did not give that to you. So when you substitute M in here, a wonderful thing happens. The big T becomes little t over big N. There's the 2 pi. And the M becomes KX over G. And then that K comes down, or is down already. So those cross out. So it's T divided by N, which is 2 pi, the stretch distance divided by gravity. Now granted, the oscillation of the um, spring is not dependent on the distance that you pull it. This X is the distance that it stretched from its unstretched rest position to its at rest stretch position. So T is 2 pi N square root X over G. So this is 2 pi times 30. X is uh, 10 over pi squared. And then G is 10. Now watch this fun part. What's 10 divided by 10? 1. What's the square root of pi squared? Pi. So that crosses out with that. And you're left with 60. And so it was intentional that the stretch length had a pi squared in the denominator. Because I, like you, I don't think of you and me as lazy. I think of you and me as efficient. And so I wanted to reward the individuals. A lot of times my problems come out exact just so you know I've thought ahead and I've plotted it out. Yes. In this particular case, yes. A lot of people look at Hooke's Law and see that negative sign. That negative sign, its intent is to let you know that the force is opposite of whatever direction you pull it or push it. In terms of dealing with magnitudes and that guy, you have to use that. And that's what I would use. All right. In, uh, in Hooke's Law, if you're using it like this as a vector, if I stretched it this way, the force would be that way. If I pushed it that way, the force would be that way. But what I tend to do is I, I tend to use logic and deal with the magnitude. So the magnitude is kx. I know that the force of the spring is up, so there's got to be a positive sign in front of it. I know that the force of gravity is down, so there's got to be a negative sign in front of it. This is why I, my g is positive 9.8. And then I let logic dictate what signs go out in front of the kx or the mg or whatever you're talking about. And so, and that is, that's the thing. Um, those are the 12 problems that I wrote. So what I would do now is I would go home and finagle a few of them, flush them out, and pick four of them to be the four problems on the test. And then I would have, the, what I have is 20, uh, a bank of about 300 multiple choice, and I pull 25 out at random and throw them into the test, and then that just goes in. So that's how I write my stuff. Um, that's all I got. So unless there are questions, I mean, do you have any remaining questions? Yes. If you've got, if you've got, I think if it looks simple, you use translational only. If it looks really complex, like this, you're going to choose a torque, and you're going to have to choose a rotation point around that. I would say that problems like 
problems like this are in the minority in terms of a lot of the chapter nine, chapter 9 problems are not pure translational problems. I would say that the vast majority of them are torque with a little bit of translational motion with them. So I would say that in anything, if it's forces pulling on a point, that's pure translational. Anything else, it's a combination of both. I would say that's, that's the answer. Anything else? All right. I think we've done good work. The bear? Oh, wait. What do you mean? Oh, the... Um, that one. All right. My Venmo account is Vance-Eschenberg. So if you haven't sent me the money, that would be greatly appreciated. I do accept cash. If you want my business card, I'm up front. Um, I'm going to go home and pass out now. <laughs>